Good afternoon and welcome to the continuing webinar series sponsored by the North American Vascular Biology Organization. I'm Linda Shapiro from the University of Connecticut and a member of the NAVVO Education Committee. I will be moderating today's session. We're pleased to welcome our speaker, Strider Meadows from Tulane University, who will present his work entitled Angiopotent II Inhibition Rescues Arteriovenous Malformation in a SMAD4 HHT Mouse Model. At this time, I'd also like to welcome Angela Christ, also from Tulane University. She will monitor today's questions. The questions can be handled in two ways. Throughout the presentation, you can type your questions into the question box in the control panel. These will be answered at the end of the presentation. Dr. Christ will compi compile and then compose, co pose the questions to Dr. Meadows. At the end of the question and answer period, provided there's time, attendees will be able to ask any additional questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon on the left side of your control panel. You'll be recognized and your mic will be unmuted so you'll be able to ask your question live. Before we get started, I wanted to go over some logistical aspects. Throughout this webinar, you're able to switch between the phone audio and the computer audio in case you're having a problem. You can see this information on the audio section of your GoToWebinar control panel. If you experience a few words being skipped in the audio, it may be your Wi-Fi connection. Connecting to the internet through a hard wire should remedy the audio. If you experience technical problems, please click on the Help tab at the top of the control panel. Scroll to the bottom of the Help screen for the technical support phone number. This webinar is being recorded and archived on the NAVBA website for future use. Dr. Meadows received his PhD from the University of Arizona and trained as a postdoctoral fellow at UT Southwestern Medical Center. He currently holds an associate professorship at the Tulane University Department of Cell and Molecular Biology. His lab uses a combination of mouse genetics and in vitro experimental approaches to understand the basic molecular mechanisms of vascular development and disease. Today's webinar will present research on the molecular pathways associated with the vascular disorder heter heredity, hereditary hemorrhagic tangle, I'll let him do it, HHT, in, perfect, in particular to identify TGF beta downstream targets that are involved in the formation of arteriovenous malformations that occur in HHT patients and explore potential therapeutics to relieve symptoms of HHT. Welcome, Dr. Meadows. I turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Linda, um, and welcome to everyone. Uh, and I'd also like to start out by thanking NABO for giving me the opportunity to talk about our most recent uh, uh, work. And also a thank you to CureHHT, who is uh, sponsoring this webinar. And so today I'm gonna talk about some of our efforts trying to understand the molecular mechanisms that are involved in uh, the genetic disorder called hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. That's a mouthful, but we call it HHT for short. So HHT is an autosomal dominant genetic disorder that affects the vasculature, uh, meaning if, if you're affected with this, if you're an HHT patient, that you have a 50% chance of, of giving this to your offspring. And it affects about one in 5,000 people, regardless of age, sex, uh, or, or race. And I'd like to point out that the one in 5,000 prevalence is at the same rates or more prevalent than other more well-known diseases such as cystic fibrosis or muscular dystrophy. Now, when you look at the clinical symptoms of HHT, uh, one of the typical ones you see are what are, we call these telangiectasias, which are really these dilated small blood vessels that like to form in the mucocutaneous tissues. So seen here with these red spots, you can see those a lot of times in the skin, on the lips, in the tongue, and in the nasal passages, and they also tend to form in the GI tract. So as a consequence, what can happen is a lot of the HHT patients have really, really severely severe uh, nosebleeds. As well, they can also have GI bleeding and can be anemic. Another major clinical symptom, and one that we're very interested in understanding, are called arterial venous malformations, or AVMs. And HHT patients are at a predisposition to form AVMs a lot of times in very major organs, such as the brain, lung, and the liver. So what is an AVM? So over here on this part, we think about uh, the normal circulation of the, of the blood into the vasculature, 
the blood is being pumped out from the heart into arterial cells at a higher higher rate and then at some point they come back to the heart uh, through the venous uh, uh, venous blood vessels at a much slower rate now in between those are the capillaries and the capillaries are where a lot of the, where the oxygen and the nutrients diffuse out to support the tissues but what they also do is they do diffuse uh, the rate at which blood flows from the artery so that when they come to the veins, they're at, a, they're at a much slower rate. Now, in HHT patients, what happens is that this capillary network uh, becomes very much enlarged and also very sort of tortuous. And what ends up happening with this enlargement is it doesn't allow for the blood to slow down. And so without that slowing down of the blood, these veins and these other vessels are not designed to hold that type of pressure. And as a consequence, what can happen is it can burst and hemorrhage, which can lead to stroke, aneurysm, and, and occasionally death. And the other important point to note is that, is that usually these things are treated surgically or through an embolization, but there really are no drug treatments per se for AVMs. Now, from a research aspect, um, what's nice about HHT is that it appears to be caused by disruptions in a very uh, uh, in a very specific signaling pathway called the TGF beta signaling pathway, and these are haploinsufficient defects. So here's just a little bit, sort of a short background on transforming growth factor beta signaling pathway. And it's thought, as far as HHT patients, is that uh, signaling comes through this portion of the pathway through the BMP9, and that is partially because there have been uh, a few reports of BMP9 mutations in patients that present with HHT-like symptoms. And so through this pathway, predominantly through the co-receptors, endoglin and ALK1, as you get phosphorylation of the regulatory SMADs, which then are bound by the co-SMAD or the common SMAD4, and that that together in combination is allowed to enter into the nucleus and serve as a transcription factor where it can either inhibit or activate transcription. And in terms of HHT, these three genes, endoglin, ALK1, and SMAD4, uh, make up a very large portion of patients uh, with mutations in these diseases. All right, so with endoglin, ALK1, and these are heterozygous loss of function mutations, up to 80, around 85% of HHT patients have mutation in these genes, with the lower percentage of patients having a combined syndrome of the juvenile polyposis, which is a formation of these particular types of polyps in the GI tract, uh, that also present with HHT when, you're, uh, when they have a SMAD4 mutation. And so when I got interested in HHT, uh, a lot of the research was focused on the uh, ligand receptor interface, uh, but we, uh, we became much more interested in, in this aspect of it. And, and mostly in part because there really was not much known about what are the downstream effectors of this pathway that are involved in HHT, and in this case also ABM formation. And so that's something that we become very interested in understanding. And so today what I'm gonna talk about are two different publications from the lab. Uh, and the first one centers on this, was first trying to figure out what is SMAD4's role in ABM formation, and that is could we make a SMAD4 model of HHT, and then to going on and looking at the cellular and molecular defects associated with ABMs. And then what's the most, our most recent paper, what we're really trying to get at is what are the downstream mediators that are actually driving ABM pathogenesis uh, that, that is seen in HHT patients. So first I'll start with this part. And the way that we took the experimental approach that we took was to basically de delete, genetically delete SMAD4 using an inducible Cree LOX P system, where we use Ralph Adams Cat5 Cree ERT2 so that we can inducibly um, uh, activate Cree recombinase specifically in endothelial cells. And what you'll notice here is that, and you'll see the rest of the talk, is that we're going to be doing a homozygous knockout. And oftentimes, uh, I get asked, um, this is different than a patient's where a heterozygous loss of function, whereas we are doing a homozygous loss of function. And in part, we do that because a lot of the uh, heterozygous loss of function models in the mice uh, don't often form ABMs or they're not consistent in where they form. And as you'll see, when we look at the homozygous model, uh, it's a little bit more to uh, track these ABMs. And so what we're going to use uh, for this studies are looking at the retinal, retinovasculature, and 
and this is the setup of how we do it pretty much throughout the talk. And so what we're doing is right after birth at about at P1, we're giving tamoxifen to the pups intragastrically um, to induce dilation in the endothelial cells, and we'll be collecting at P7. And so what happens when we knock out SMAD4 uh, in the retina? So here, just to bring your call your attention over here, if you look at the inset here, normally if you're looking at the retinal vasculature, everything in green, you have the artery and a vein, which have physically uh, character physical characteristics that distinguish them both, with an artery usually being thinner and having this capillary clearance zone where there's not capillaries near it. And then the vein, which tends to be thicker and has lots of capillaries near it. And then in between, you have this nice capillary plexus. Now, one of the first things we found when we looked at our mutant mice, which is the SMAD4 eye echo mice, is that we formed these really large shunts, direct shunts between an artery and a vein uh, that very much reminiscent of AVMs. And also with that, you'll notice that the capillary plexus, the vessels seem to be enlarged as well. And so in most cases quantified here, we're able to see when we knock out SMAD4 uh, in the retinal vasculature, we could, we could uh, subsequently they would form lots of AVMs. We had also find a decrease in the retinal vascular outgrowth. And I think more importantly, uh, as it's associated with HHT, um, is that we saw an enlargement of a lot of the vessels, or really all of the vessels, both in the arteries and in the veins, quantified here and here, uh, but much more distinguished in the veins. Um, and so uh, what we felt like we had here, and, and I should say, even when we had mutants where we did not have AVMs, they typically always showed an enlargement in both the arteries and the veins. And so what we, we had here is a, what we thought was a very nice model of AVM pathogenesis using SMAD4 as a knockout. And I should say that these results are very similar to those in other TGF beta receptor studies by a number of groups, and in particular, Helen Arthur's shown here, looking at when you knock out endoglin or ALK1, you also form AVMs in a very similar manner uh, uh, methods that were used to study this in the retina. And so with this, what we wanted to do was see how similar, in a sense, um, SMAD4 knockout was compared to the other HHG models of whether cellular and molecular defects that, are, um, that were tied to this loss of SMAD4 were similar to other HHG models. And so uh, I'm going to go through a couple of things that we, we uh, that we found in our studies. And so if you look at here again, looking at a control retina, we have a nice artery, nice capillary plexus, and then the vein. And here he shows an, a whole array of different types of AVMs. But what you'll notice is that if you look at an artery versus a vein, they're very hard to distinguish which was an artery and a vein. Was suggested that perhaps, and has others have suggested that artery vein identity. Uh, was disrupted in these mutants. And so we decided to take a fairly detailed look at that. And the first part that we did is we isolated lung endothelial cells and checked uh, expression levels of a bunch of different genes, both vein at, shown in blue and artery marker shown in red. And so um, there's a bunch right here. Um, and then what we did is we looked at some of these and we looked at them also on the retina. And for many of the cases, they seem to um, uh, uh, seem to have the same type of upregulation or downregulation in the lung and the cells as well as the retinal. And so I'll just point out a couple. So let's look at endomucin. So endomucin, uh, a more uh, typically more of a venous marker, was upregulated. And normally what you see with endomucins in the veins and in the capillary plexus and very weakly in the arteries. But when you knock out SMAT4, you get an expression of endomucin now um, uh, sorry, now in these arteries, and maybe even a little bit more expression in the veins. Now, when you look at another marker of, of uh, venous identity, F from B4, which happened to be down, here looking at in situ hybridization. This is a marker that tends to more or less mostly be in veins, but also in arteries in the retina. Now, when you knock out SMAT4, you see a dramatic loss of FB4, and you really only see it persist in veins, but interestingly, it's also in the AVM as well. Now, look at an artery marker, notch four, which goes up. If you look at the, the mutant versus the control here, you'll see that it does appear that notch four also seems to be um, increased. And then one of the most uh, uh, highly differentially expressed genes uh, 
was aplin, which aplin normally uh, marks uh, a bit of the arteries and also the tip cell region. And what you can see here in the mutant is you get quite a lot of expression of aplin. And if you look at aplin's receptor, in this case APJ, there seemed to be not much different in expression levels, which held true both the lung and the retinal endothelial cells. And so when we looked at this data, there wasn't a specific pattern per se, but the one commonality was that identity or expression of all these artery vein genes seemed to be disrupted. It might potentially be a reason for how these AVMs um, uh, arise. Now, another thing that we noticed uh, previously shown here again is the enlargement of the vessels. So why could the vessels become enlarged? And so one of the first things that we looked at was endothelial cell proliferation. So shown here on the left is the control, where we're marking proliferating cell, the KI67. And then in the knockout, showing you areas without an AVM and areas with an AVM. And what you can find when we looked here is that you got quite a lot of proliferation in the veins uh, and a little bit in the artery, as opposed to the wild type, there's not much in the, there's little in the veins and, and very little in the artery. And then when you look at the region with an AVM, the AVM itself has quite a lot of proliferation, as does the plexus, and as does the veins. And so you can see that quantified here, where you get a little bit of uh, increased proliferation arteries, but you get a marked increased uh, proliferation capillaries and veins. So this could explain uh, some of the reasons for seeing an enlarged vasculature. Another thing that uh, suggests uh, how vessels could get bigger, um, is the actual size of the cells. So when we take a close look at these cells, when you compare wild type versus mutant, either an artery or vein, outlined in the dotted white lines, as you can see, arterial areas and venous areas increase. And this was in line with previous research uh, for Christy Redhorse's lab showing that loss of SMAD4 increased the vessel diameters in coronary vessels. As also is um, with experiments done in zebrafish looking at loss of endoglin showing an increase in cell shapes. So perhaps uh, proliferation and cell size increases could account for this enlargement of the vessels. Also what we wanted to look at was what was the effect on mural cell coverage in these mutants. And so typically uh, when we look at a smooth muscle, alpha smooth muscle actin which uh, wraps around arterial cells shown here in the control, is that we found in the mutants you get, you get smooth muscle actin expressed in most of these major vessels. Uh, both artery and, and what are veins. Um, and that was quite consistent and consistent with other models of HHT. And also suggested that, again that maybe there is something wrong with the arterial venous identity, which allowed perhaps smooth muscle cell um, deposition there. Uh, although we also know that blood flow has something to do with that as well. And when we looked at pericytes, if you look here in red, NG2 marker pericytes uh, is wrapped around all the vessels. Now, when we looked at our SMAD4 mutants, we see quite a reduction in uh, pericytes, so a loss of coverage in pericytes. And so what, what we found through these experiments uh, really was, was sort of commonalities with other HHT phenotypes um, and other HHT models, such as AV information in large blood vessels and all these other characteristics that I've defined. But what we then wanted to do was to use a SMAD4 mouse and to really get at trying to understand what are the downstream mediators that are actually driving AVM pathogenesis and other HHT associated phenotypes. And so that will be on the more recent work, which is the title of the talk. Now, in order to do this, we utilized a next generation sequencing methods to really try to hone in and try to identify TGF beta downstream effectors. And so the first thing we did is we went and we isolated uh, retinal endothelial cells from both the control and SMAD4 mutant mice, and we performed RNA sequencing. And when we did that, we came out with 1,905 differentially expressed genes. And then what we wanted to do was take advantage of SMAD4 being a transcription factor, was to perform chip sequencing. So in this case, we're using uh, cultured mouse endothelial cells. And what we wanted to do is we stimulated with BMP9, BMP10 to try to sort of stimulate that pathway that we think HHT is affecting. With the idea that we could find out what genes are being bound by SMAD4 and being regulated by SMAD4. And when we did this, we had 1,989 SMAD4 binding sites. So that's qu quite a lot of genes to go through. 
So what we simply did was just integrated these two different data sets. And what we came along with was about 212 uh, potentially important genes for HHT or AVM pathogenesis. And shown below here is just a table, a sample table of, of, of some of the genes with your gene here, uh, the full change from RNA sequencing data, and then the number of binding sites and the location of those binding sites with the chip sequencing data. And now when we looked at this list of genes, what became very interesting to us um, happened to be tech, or most people know as TIE2, but I'll refer to as tech, is that tech came up and its antagonistic ligand angiopoietin 2 also came up. And so what you see here, and sort of the theme for us to talk, is that uh, expression of tech seemed to be down, and its antagonistic ligand expression of it seemed to be up. And so we wanted to pursue this angle. And there's a couple of reasons we liked or we want to pursue the angiopoietin tech signaling angle. And in part is because vascular development and disease is well known with the tech angiopoietin signaling. And so here I've got a very simple background slide uh, trying to understand the signaling pathway where TEC is a receptor tyrosine kinase, primarily expressed on endothelial cells, so signaling is happening in here. Most often, angiopoietin-1, is sort of the stimulating ligand, is being expressed from the mural cells. And that interaction, in general, is thought to stabilize the vasculature. However, angiopoietin-2, which is also primarily expressed in endothelial cells, is thought to be an antagonistic ligand. And so what happens when angiopoietin-2 is around is it, it results in a downregulation of signaling through tech, and it results in an unstable active vasculature. A vasculature is sort of what we define in HHT as what looks like an active vasculature. And so what we found was that we have a downregulation of tech, an upregulation of angiopoietin-2, which suggests that we might have a net reduction in tech signaling. And the other reason that we like this angiopoietin tech signaling pathway as a potential mediator of HHT was for a number of reasons. And one that is that um, the angiopoietin tech signaling pathway had been recently linked to vein specification. And if you remember, our SNAP4 mutants showed a disruption in venous identity. And another really important one, uh, I think, is that when you look at angiopoietin and tech expression levels in sporadic AVMs, you see the same relationship where angiopoietin 2 is up and tech is down. And also interestingly is that tech activating mutations, so different than what we are seeing in our results, but mutations that activate tech signaling are associated with venous malformations, these slow, full, slow flow vascular malformations uh, depicted here. So there might be a sort of balance to go from venous to arterial venous malformations. And then lastly, there are some recent uh, evidence suggesting that when you lose tech, um, in this case ubiquitously in the retina, you start to form, you see an enlargement of vessels similar to what we had seen in our somatoform mutants, and that you also see these vessels connect to other vessels. So if you look at this one particularly here, um, it's blown up here, it's over here, and so you can see it connecting from one major vessel to another, very AVM-like. And so for these reasons, we really liked uh, the thought of pursuing to see how this these signaling pathway might be involved in HHT. And so the first thing we did was to go back and verify and try to see if this relationship uh, uh, stayed uh, through, throughout our studies. And so what we did is we isolated retinal endothelial cells and lung endothelial cells. And in all cases, we see a drastic increase in angiopoietin expression at the mRNA level. Also see a downregulation of tech mRNA expression. When you look at the protein, you see the same thing. You see an increase in angiopoietin protein expression um, and also a tech downregulation, although this tech antibody is uh, not the best. We also reason that because angiopoietin-2 is, is a ligand that gets secreted, that perhaps you might have more angiopoietin in the bloodstream. And so we tested that um, using blood plasma from our mutant and control mice. And also, in the same case, we found an increase in angiopoietin in the blood plasma. The next thing that we want to do is look at the mRNA localization of angiopoietin and tech. And so here we... Uh, the, the vasculature is uh, stained with, with green and an in situ hybridization for angiopoietin uh, to uh, RNA. And what you can see is that typically, and you might be able to see it a little bit better here looking at just an, uh, the in situ hybridization, is that normally angiopoietin 2 in these retinas aren't expressed at very high levels. 
But what happens as these retinal vasculature is growing, they're widely expressed, robustly expressed in these tip cell regions of the vasculature um, and a little bit behind the vasculature. Now, when you look at tech, tech is normally expressed in just about every vessel, although if you see here, it's actually absent from the tip cells, and this is known. Uh, but when you look at SMAD4 mutants, in this case, you see a, a loss of tech expression uh, especially in the tip cell-ish region um, and a lot of other places. But interestingly, tech was maintained in the AVM. And I should say that whenever we've looked at genes where that seem to be down-regulation in our model or down-regulated in our model, they typically also seem to be expressed in the AVM, and we're not sure why that is. But what we felt like we had here was a direct sort of uh, correlation between expression of angiopoietin and, and tech expression. And so we came up with a hypothesis, a very simple hypothesis, is that SMAD4 transcriptionally regulates expression of angiopoietin 2 to control AVM formation. So typically what happens is signaling through TGF beta pathway through SMAD4 acts as an inhibitor on angiopoietin expression. And so when we lose SMAD4, we lose this repression and it's able to induce expression of angiopoietin 2. And now uh, we're focusing here on angiopoietin 2, and I'll just get briefly why we're focusing on ang2 uh, and not tech. And so to start looking at this hypothesis and where it sort of came from was through a lot of our chip sequencing data. So let's look at the chip sequencing data for angiopoietin. So here's our angiopoietin gene. Here's the upstream region of that gene. Uh, what you have here is we have um, unstimulated uh, mouse endothelial cells uh, with chip sequencing for SMAD4. Uh, we have uh, MS1 endothelial cells where we stimulated with BMP9 uh, and we overlay those and shown up here a little bit better. Uh, you can see it more in detail. And what we found is there's three different peaks for where SMAD4 bound. And if you compare the BMP9 stimulated blue over the non-stimulated gray, you can see in two of these three, there is an uh, enrichment of SMAD4 binding in these peaks. And now the other thing that we thought was uh, really remarkable is that these regions were also in regions that were evolutionally conserved between different species. So these non-coding regions, both in human and chimpanzees. And so this suggests suggested that having these non-coding evolutionary conserved regions suggests that these are important regulatory regions uh, that uh, might have an effect on angiopoietin expression. And to get a little bit further at that, as we decided to test the transcriptional activity of each peak, peak one, two, and three, in a luciferase reporter assay. And we did that in the cell lines, two different cell lines, where we had a non-silencing shRNA control cell line, uh, mouse endothelial cells again, and then a SMAD4 depleted mouse endothelial cell line. And so if you see here in the dark gray here, uh, is that when you add either of these peaks, peak one, peak two, and peak three, you see you get an increase in expression of luciferase, suggesting that these are transcriptionally active regions. However, when you test the same peaks in cells that are deficient in SMAT4, you actually get a marked increase in all three cases of expression in angiopoietin, or in this, sorry, in this case of luciferase, uh, which suggests that if you look at this model again, that SMAD4 typically, or what we think is normally happen, is repressing angiopoietin expression, but this gets uh, relieved, and now angiopoietin expression goes up, uh, which makes sense with the luciferase reporter assays. So uh, to sort of come back to this, now we're thinking about this in terms of uh, how we could use this as a way of looking at therapies uh, that are targeted for angiopoietin 2. So again, looking back here in our SMAD4 knockout mice, is that SMAD4 no longer represses angiopoietin 2. Now we have excess expression of the angiopoietin 2 ligand. And so that we reason that perhaps we could actually inhibit the function of this excess, uh, this excess angiopoietin 2 and see how that might have a, an effect on avian formation. And to do that, uh, we worked with Roche, uh, which supplied us with an angiopoietin mouse monoclonal antibody that binds to angiopoietin 2 and inhibits its function. And I might also refer to this as LC10. So we decided to test that. And so looking up here is the schematic for how we do that. Again, we're, we're inducing deletion at P1. And we're going to collect at P7. Uh, and we know that AVMs in our system form around P4 to P5. And so what we asked first is, could we prevent the AVMs from forming? 
by giving the drug before the AVMs form. And we did so at P2. So here's the data that we have here. And so our controls are IgG, which is these retinas look perfectly normal. You look at our somatophore mutants, you get these nice and large AVMs, you get these nice and large vessels. Then what we did is we injected the LC10, and this was actually an, another nice positive control because it's been shown that LC10, which is the inhibitor of angiopoietin 2, does cause a reduction in vascular outgrowth. And then what we found is that when we injected the angiopoietin inhibitor to these somatophore mutants, is that we were able to prevent any AVMs from forming. So if you look at here, you can see AVMs are forming in the mutants. And here are the mutants that have been injected with LC10 inhibitor. We didn't find any AVMs at all, suggesting that we can prevent AVM formation. And on top of that, if you notice too, is we also found that the diameters of these both of the vessels, both in the veins and in the arteries, were also maintained, uh, retained at the control levels. So shown here for the veins, you can see in the mutant, it goes up. The arteries, it also goes up. Now, when you treat it with LC10 inhibitor, we're back down to diameters in the, in the normal control range. Now, this was a really nice experiment, but typically patients um, already have the AVM, so this would necessarily work uh, as a therapeutic uh, means for patients. So we decided to change our experiment slightly, and that is what we've done here, is we decided to let the AVMs form and then inject the LC10 inhibitor at about P6, and we're collecting a day later just to give it a little bit more time to it for it so for the inhibitor to take its effects. So coming back here again, our SMAD4 mutants, you see these nice and large vessels, these nice AVMs that have formed. Now, when you've looked at here at P8, when the vasculature of the retina has had a lot more time to form, at this point the LC10 inhibitor doesn't really seem to have any effects uh, itself on the control retinas. However, when you add this LC10 inhibitor to the SMAD4 mutants, we get very wild type looking retinal vasculature. It was really actually quite surprising to us. And in fact, and shown quantified here, is that we hardly found any AVMs. We only found a couple AVMs when we gave the mutants this LC10 inhibitor. And the two AVMs that we found were much smaller in size and diameter than the AVMs that we had seen in our, our, our regular mutants. And again, not only that, were we in a sense able to rescue the AVM formation, but when you look at the vein diameters, which increase in the mutants, is that when you give the LC10, we're able to revert back down to more of a control wild type levels in the diameters of the both arteries and the veins. And we think in part this in, that this the angiopoietin inhibition is causing a reversion in, in the a reversion in the size of the endothelial cells and the shapes. So that's shown here. So this is the experiment where we give the inhibitor after the AVMs have formed and we're able to rescue them. So if you look over here in control, here's a control vessel marked with PCAM. And what we've done is we've taken some of these cells and we've uh, marked them with black and we've enlarged them proportionally. And what you can see with the control versus the mutant, like we've already seen previously, is you get an increase in cell, in cell area. And this is looking here in the venous cell area from control to mutants. And, and also what we see is we started to also look at the shape of these endothelial cells. And so the way we did that was using a program that measures what we call shape factor. And that is that anything that's as round as can be would give it given a number one, and the thinner it gets is given a number zero. So if you look at uh, the wild types, they're fairly, uh, they're sort of roundish in, in, in shape. But in the mutants, they start to become much thinner and elongated, as shown here. Now, when we started to use the inhibitors, when you use LC10, there seems to be no changes in cell area or cell shape. But when we give LC10 to the mutants, what we found, again, is a reduction in the cell area of these endothelial cells, um, shown in here. You see it go back down to normal levels across the board compared to the mutants in both the arteries and the venous endothelial cells. And what you found also was the shapes had changed. And in fact, the shapes actually got a bit more rounder. And you can see that bear out here, that it goes a little bit above control levels in both the arteries and veins. But virtually what we're, we seem to be happening is that you're getting somewhat of a reversion in the size and shape of these endothelial cells 
uh, that might be playing a role in how we are able to rescue or prevent these enlargement and AVM formation to occur. And so with that, we have a, a working model where, again, what we think is happening is that normally or typically SMAD4 is acting as a repressor on angiopoietin 2. And that helps, in, in a sense, regulate certain size and shape of the endothelial cells, which as a consequence gives you a normal vascular bed. However, when you lose SMAD4, such as an HHT signaling, what we think is happening is that angiopoietin then becomes overexpressed. And as a consequence of that, the endothelial cells themselves get larger uh, and they change shape. And the, so does the diameters of the blood vessels as well. And so as a, another consequence, what you think happens is then you start to form these AVMs uh, that you see in, in patients. And we think that if you take this state here and give it or inhibit angiopoietin, at least in our, our studies, that you're able to sort of revert back to a more normal vascular uh, type of vasculature. And so with that, I'd like to just kind of summarize this. This is a lot of words. I'll try to make it a little bit more simple. But the first paper that we were sort of talking about was, was seeing if we could make a SMAP4 mouse model of HHT. And we were able to do that. And they were very similar to other models of Alquin and Endoglin. And I should also point out that subsequent studies from Ann Eichmann and Paul O's lab have also shown uh, very similar results with SMAP4 knockdown. And that is that we get AVMs to form. There seems to be a, a marked disruption in artery vein identity. Uh, we get, we think partially you get increased vessel size due to endothelial cell proliferation and endothelial size and shape, and that you get a change in mural cell coverage as well. And then what, what we've really been trying to come to is getting more of a therapeutic uh, efforts is to try to identify uh, TGF-beta downstream effectors that are involved in maybe in pathogenesis and HHT. HHT. And so we use the genomics approach that to reveal tech and angiopoietin as potential mediators of HHT and others, which I'm not talking about. Um, and that relationship seemed to be that tech would be down expressed and angiopoietin would be overexpressed, suggesting an overall reduction in tech signaling. And we think we provide at least a mechanism that SMAD4 re normally represses angiopoietin transcription and that when it's not present, angiopoietin is overexpressed or becomes expressed. And so angiopoietin inhibition using the LC10 and, uh, angiopoietin inhibitor from Roche in our mouse model, we are able to prevent and rescue AV inflammation. And we think this in large part is due to changes in the endothelial cell size and shape as well. Um, and the other thing I, I like to point out with thinking about this in terms of therapeutic approaches for patients is that it does appear that angiopoietin inhibitors are, are actually being tested in clinical trials right now. And we think perhaps we found another indication of these inhibitors uh, for HHT. So primarily, most of these uh, companies are, are studying the effects of these inhibitors on solid tumors, uh, formation of these solid tumors, and is also looking at wet AMD. And in some cases, this, these are uh, studies are in, in phase two of the clinical trials. So we think angiopoietin 2 may have some therapeutic value for treating AVMs in HHT patients, in part, in part because typically angiopoietin 2 is only uh, expressed more so in an active vasculature, which we think is what an HHT vasculature is. And so by providing then an inhibitor to angiopoietin 2, perhaps we can alleviate HHT phenotypes. Um, so we're hopeful that perhaps we've, we've come on to something that might be useful for these patients. And so with that, I'd like to acknowledge the members of my lab. Uh, I have to point out uh, who's on the line, Angela Christ. Uh, per pretty much most, if not all, almost all the work is done by Angela Christ in my lab, uh, who's actually Dr. Christ now. She successfully defended her PhD. Uh, and she was had support from an undergraduate student, Amanda Lee, and uh, graduate student, Xin Yen, who will now be sort of overtaking the project and moving it along. Also, like to thank the other collaborators, uh, especially Roach, uh, the angiopoietin inhibitor, made a big difference in our studies. And I'd also like to thank the, our funding sources. And lastly, I'd like to thank NAPO and CureHHT uh, for sponsoring this webinar. And with that, I'm, I'll take any of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Meadows. I see we have several questions from the audience, so I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Chris so she can direct these questions to Dr. Meadows. <laughs> 
All righty. So um, we do have quite a few questions. We'll try to get through all of them. The first one is in SMAD4 mutants, do these AVMs persist into adulthood and um, are they found in other organs such as the brain, liver, and lungs? All right, great question. So they do not persist in adults because uh, what I didn't tell you is that when you lose SMAD4 in the vasculature, these mice survive to about P10 at the latest. And so it's, uh, it's difficult to have a, an adult model, which we would love to have. Uh, as far as uh, do we see AVMs in other vasculature, vascular beds, my lab has only taken a cursory look and we haven't really seen any, uh, but there are other studies that have used the same uh, methods where you, you induce deletion very early and you look at, say, P6 and P7. And they've seen, at least with SMAD4 and ALK1, to see AVMs that form um, in the GI tract. And then uh, a more recent study by Paul O, where he did a global endothelial cell knockout, sorry, not sorry, a global knockout of SMAD4, is that, again, being globally knocked out in the early neonate and looked at P7, as you can find AVMs also in the brain and in the head region. Um, so, so they can form, but I, we think that perhaps you might have to tweak when you're deleting SMAD4 to see if you can get AVMs to form in certain ways, especially because SMAD4 is so important for vascular development. All right, and then kind of on the lines of that, do these AVMs ever return after they're treated with LC10? Yeah, that's a good question. We haven't done any of those studies. Uh, basically, we've, used, we've just euthanized the mouse, the mice, and looked at them. Um, that's something we uh, we could look at. And the other thing that other people have done, which we've also been interested in doing, is actually just to see if we maintain angiopoietin inhibition, do these mice actually survive longer because of the beneficial effects? Um, but but we, we don't know the, the answer to that first question. All right, and then the next question is, do you think that increases in angiopoietin 2 itself are sufficient to cause the AVMs? Or is it more of a combination of the reduction in TI2 and other SMAD4, um, you know, downstream regulators of that pathway? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, uh, it'd be nice to know if it's sufficient to actually induce AV inflammation. My guess is that it's not. Um, there's a lot of genes that are misregulated. And my guess is that it's a mixture of them. Um, in, in fact, we th we think, we don't know, and we're trying to study it now, is, is we think that a large part is that this misregulation in a bunch of these genes in the artery vein uh, uh, blood vessels as well as maybe tip cells, sort of it's this combination of those that are help it uh, carry along to for these AVMs to, to arise. So we don't know that we don't know whether angiopoietin 2 is sufficient to do it, although it's a it'd be an interesting question to look at. Uh, but my guess is uh, uh, it's probably other factors involved as well. All right, so we have three more questions with some more coming in as well. Um, so this question is, angiopoietin 2 is known to regulate vessels, vessel integrity, especially in the lymphatics. So does inhibiting ANG2 cause any vessel integrity loss or leakiness, and does inhibiting ANG2 affect the lymphatics? Yeah, another good question. We just, we haven't, we haven't uh, analyzed the vessels enough to look at um, we haven't looked at the integrity of the blood vessels once angiopoietin uh, inhibition has been applied. Um, and we're looking to look at more what's happening once we've applied angiopoietin in inhibition. Um, so don't have the answer for that. As far as lymphatics, we have, uh, we have no idea on that front. We're not, we don't study lymphatics, although I'm always interested in studying lymphatics, but I, I don't have an answer to that question either. All right, so um, you have shown that the angiopoietin 2 expression was upregulated largely in tip cells. So do you think these angiopoietin 2 expression in the tip cells are needed for the maintenance of AVMs that are formed in the more proximal regions? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, but it is interesting that, so angiopoietin isn't the only other tip cell marker. We have a couple other prominent tip cell markers that are also uh, robustly overexpressed. Um, I'm not sure if it would be uh, required to maintain AVM expression or not. My my feeling is that once the AVMs form, it may not be because another thing that 
we we can't we don't aren't able to study as well as um is the role that blood flow and it's known that blood flow plays an important role in AVM formation and so it could be that once you sort of start to establish an AVM that you may not need tip cells uh, so to speak to maintain it but that the blood vessel a blood flow may help to maintain it so, um, so I'm not sure about that but that's a good question Okay, and this question that just came in is very similar to that question, but I want to make sure it gets answered. Um, how do you hypothesize that increased angiopoietin 2 at the sprouting front causes AVMs near the center of the retinal vasculature? Yeah, that's a good question, and we're looking at that now, but when you think about that, as these things are forming, is the, the vasculature is growing to outwards, right? And so you can imagine that at some point where those, where those AVMs have formed, that that would be a front, at some point where the tip cells are at. And so um, it could be that as the blood vessels are growing, um, the angiopoietin is being overexpressed in the tip cells and that that proceeds and then the, an AVM starts to occur and then becomes established through the blood flow as the tip cells and the vasculature proceeds. But uh, we're going back to look at that sort of backwards and look at angiopoietin. In a sense, does angiopoietin overexpression in the tip cells um, overlap where we typically see these ABMs to form. And my guess is that it does. All right, and switching gears, um, does SMAD4 affect ALK1 and endoglin expression levels in endothelial cells? Yes, in our case it does. Uh, uh, take it back. It seems to affect endoglin expression, but not ALK1 from our studies. Uh, we don't see it ever really to affect ALK1 expression, but we definitely see it ex uh, affect endoglin expression. And in fact, when you look at our chip sequencing data, we get a really strong SMAD4 binding site on endoglin gene, but we don't get that in ALK1. So there's something interesting about that. And part of the reason I mentioned that too is because if you look at the all three different mouse models and you look at them in the retinal vasculature, they have sort of subtle differences and typically, we feel like the SMAD4 and the endoglins seem to be a little bit more alike with ALK1 being slightly different. And that would kind of make sense, at least as from uh, preliminary, what we see that SMAD4 expression sort of regulates endoglin, but not ALK1 expression. All right, and I think the last question that we have here is, um, what is the role of phosphosmads 1.5 in your model? Yeah, no idea, but that that is the thought that typically through this pathway in HHT that it's this phosphosmad 1, 5, and 8 that's having an, having an effect. Um, and if I remember, I believe Ann Eichmann's studies look at that and other uh, with SMAD4, and I do believe that you see, if I'm correct, you see sort of a, a down regulation in the phosphorylation of SMADs 1, 5, and 8. But I, but I, I could be wrong about that. But, but we haven't specifically looked, but we imagine uh, it's – probably fairly similar to other the other ALK1 or endoglin mouse, mouse models where it does seem like phosphorylation of MADS 1, 5, and 8 is down. All right, and that looks like the last of our questions. So thank you guys for all of the really great and insightful questions. I'll turn it back over to Linda. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so it was really a great uh, question and answer session. Uh, so I hope you found this talk as interesting as I did. These webinars are brought to you by the NAVO Education Committee. Our next webinar is April 11th, presented by Dr. Bill Sessa from Yale University. Look for registration information on the NAVO Newsbeat. Please fill out the evaluation form at the end of the webinar or when you receive it in a subsequent email and let us know what you thought of today's webinar and any topics you might want to see in a future NAVO webinar. Thanks very much.